You know that most of the species on Earth fly? It's only a, a, a minor part of the numbers of species on Earth that crawl or walk or run. Most of them fly. It's a better way of transportation. It's coming down, O2 coming on. He's a Navy turn, let's launch it. The freedom to get away from the bounds of the Earth or the water. Those that have gone said, wow, life changing. America's first space shuttle. You know, everyone that comes back says how phenomenally neat it was. And frankly, I'm getting tired of hearing those guys talk about how neat it is. On June 21st, 2004, Mike Melville flew 62 miles above the Earth in Spaceship One to become the world's first commercial astronaut. It's away. People dream about affordable space tourism. It's not just a dream. This historic flight was the last of four powered test flights in preparation for their attempt on the richest prize in aviation history. The idea that anything that you build can leave the Earth and go out into space, it's just a fascinating area, and I don't think that that fascination is, is unique to me. In 2004, how many manned space flights? Are really good. Two. A Russian Soyuz flight and Spaceship One. Three years after the inception of their Tier 1 space program, Bert Rutan, Paul Allen, and the team at Scaled Composites are about to undertake the task for which it was designed. They are reaching for the $10 million Ansari X Prize. Someone mentioned the X Prize to me, and a friend who was really familiar with what was going on in, in aerospace mentioned that, that if you were going to do something like that, Bert Rutan was the person to talk to. And then the next one was a, a glide that included the feather configuration. You can see the wings are up on the uh -huh. icon. I love the way he had a different approach, a different creative uh, take on how you could uh, try to win the X Prize. The rules for the Ansari X Prize competition were really designed so that at the end we have a new generation of spaceships designed to carry you and I into space. It's our, our vision and our desire to make sure that space is opened up for the public irreversibly. Peter Diamanda's dream of having affordable space tourism. This is happening very soon. I think of Bert Rutan first as an artist, someone who sculpts dreams. You can see the kid in his eyes. He is uh, someone who is making a lot of our dreams come true. The three X Prize judges arrive at the Scaled Composites hangar in Mojave, California. On all scales, so we're ready to go. So here's the gist. Okay. Full up spaceship. Mm -hmm. Less people. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the only thing missing is pilot. Okay. White knight. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Spaceship One project engineer Matt Steinmetz supervises the weighing in of the ship. This is as it'll fly. This is as it'll fly. Let's pilot. Two critical criteria, I think, are the weight, both of the spacecraft and the ballast that they need to carry in lieu of passengers, and the altitude verification. Where are the airplane? Now they need to go to 328,000 feet, plus the margin that's in the air band of each measurement device. 15 volts. Okay. Yeah. To win the X Prize, a non-governmental group must make a suborbital flight to an altitude of 328,000 feet, or 62 miles, and then repeat it within two weeks, reusing at least 80% of the original craft. A gold box mounted onboard Spaceship One will measure the dynamics of its flight. The biggest challenges for these following X Prize flights are really performance and safety. You know, getting to the altitude goal that we want to with the added weight and uh, doing it safely, okay. and then turning around and doing it all over again in, in a short period of time. On June 21st, Spaceship One made history by becoming the first commercial manned spacecraft, but just barely. What happened in the June flight is that we had a trajectory error that was significant. It was real nip and tuck as to whether it, it would get there. And uh, it did just barely 400 feet out of 62 miles. It's not a lot. <laughs> it's like a tenth of 1%. Oh. The big thing is we got to carry X Prize ballast. So we built some big ballast boxes and me myself, I've just been tracking weight a lot more critically this flight because ultimately the X Prize guys have to sign up to it and say, yeah, you guys weighed it on a scale and we agree with it and we'll give you 10 million bucks when you go to space. How much is this one gonna weigh? Those kind of details, the ballast is pretty big this flight. For the June 21st flight, the whole team was concerned about just exactly why did we come so close to not making the altitude and what can we do about it? 
adding other rocket motors, mounting them somehow to the spaceship to get a little extra, a little extra impulse. There's a whole long list of things that we talked about, but one of the biggies is we're getting more energy out of this rocket motor. The real goal of the pilot during that very complicated pull-up procedure is to keep the wings level and to keep you know, each wingtip on the horizon instead of rolling right or left. And that's really the goal on the next flight, is to, to minimize those excursions. The rocket motor is producing about a ton of force. What you have to fight this ton of force and whatever gyrations it might be causing is the aerodynamic forces on the vehicle. You can think of it like the feathers of an arrow. At sea level, it, it works very well because the, the fins work and they keep it going straight. But if you try that same experiment in space, it's likely to uh, tumble and gyrate and go all around. We have a problem in that our rocket motor, which is producing this ton of force, it's easily handled to down low where the air is nice and dense because aerodynamic surfaces are keeping it flying straight and true. You go up to space, you no longer have those fins working adequately for you to fight this ton of force, which is trying to make it gyrate. Good on heading roll back. The vehicle is designed primarily to re-enter the atmosphere belly first. If it comes in backwards or upside down, then the tail booms are going to get exposed to stresses that um, they're, they're not really designed for. And it's definitely something that we really don't want to try. Better unlock. Clear better. A lot of side-to-side uh, -side, uh, rolling here. The difference between exposing yourself to, to that danger and coming back normally is how you exit the, the atmosphere, and how you exit the atmosphere is all about staying on top of it. Roger. Yeah, Josh, approach. The more dangerous, insidious problem is where you get the vehicle tumbling as it exits the atmosphere. We're through with the uh, supersonic corridor. If you're, if you're not able to stop it, that means you're spinning out, you're spinning back in, and uh, spinning back into the atmosphere is, is a bad thing. But 180,000 feet, it's, it's a real... It's like threading the needle, and um, it, it, it's taken a lot of practice for us to sort of figure out what works and what doesn't work, and, um, and uh, staying on top of it uh, all the way. To condition their bodies for the massive gravitational, or G-forces, that the X-Prize pilots must sustain, Pete Seabold and Brian Benny practice in the Extra 300, a small aerobatic airplane. You can get your body used to many things. It's unbelievable how much force there is. All the blood in your body at that acceleration rushes to the tips of your toes. You have to work very hard, tensing up your muscles to keep your, your veins constricted so you don't pass out. Eight plus seven. Good. The way that you protect yourself without a G-suit is, is exactly the way a G-suit works. You strain so that you clench your legs, and that keeps the blood up in your torso and your head. So you've got a heart and you've got a brain. The flights that we have done in, in preparation have been, besides being a, a lot of fun, but it, it's been exciting to find out where your body just ends up giving up. Fight it now, fight it, fight it, fight it. There you go. Good, 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 good. Nice, smoke off. Excellent. With the training complete, the Scaled Composites team readies Spaceship One for tomorrow's first X Prize flight. There's a valve on the front of the nitrous tank that is used for dumping the nitrous. So when we loaded the nitrous this morning and we closed it for the last time, it didn't seal up very well. It started leaking out of the valve into this bay between the cabin and the and the tank. You can see it bubbling. No, no. I mean it would actually make, make ice. I think. I'll do it if you want, but I think somebody with, with eye protection ought to be right here looking at it. Well, don't sit, don't stand in front of that. <laughs> I mean, you do this before. I mean, you put pressure on that. Don't yeah. you normally? But we don't we hammer don't, it yeah, with we 700 we psi. It. We can we can listen. Sure. You can tell what it's yeah. doing by listening. That's how we discovered the problem. Want to check it for you guys, you can easily well see that bottom thing with a hole in it and watch the rate at which it closes. Well, I, 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 you got a helmet and, and a goggles. Let's just stand right here and watch it. Yes. Okay. 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 So you got a motorcycle helmet? <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want to do it or should I do it or what? Get the bird, boss man. Oh, yes, it will. Yes, it will. Huh? Yes, it will. We figured out how to adjust it so that the so that the valve is sealed up now, but we want to make sure it's still going to operate properly. We want to do a functional check before we actually send the spaceship. Perfect. Well, I tell you, it moves faster than I thought it would. You don't need me anymore, do you? No. No, no. the danger we're told is done now. <laughs> <laughs> Your lenses should be clean by now. Thank you, sir. That top one, it looks like it does have a small scratch in it. It's one thing, it's another. This may just be a cable problem. Negative 3.5 on the left, 3.3 on the right. It's not moving. It's not moving. Hey, is Jim Ty around here? <laughs> no, is it the first time you tried moving it? It didn't move? Yes. Matt, what's going on? Right, it's down. Didn't move. Why? 
Oh, you see, that's the, that's, that's why the, I didn't want to bring it up. Well, I mean, it sounds like they're worried about the breaker. So the breaker pop out. Those pre flights where you yank them out and stuff to make sure that it cuts the power. Yeah, breaker in and out. Then it started operating. Has that happened before? Never for any reason. It's either like the wiring died for a millisecond for no reason, or did the backup work before you reset the breaker? Didn't try that. I don't think. Because I would have isolated the breaker because the backup uses its own breakers. So. I didn't think quick enough. I just like the breaker. Trying to get it. That's it. It's not a big deal. The question is, how do we know that's that? So when he came in. Does that look better or worse? Maybe it's a little off. It looks almost right on. I mean, not even a tenth of a degree, I don't think. I think it's a switch problem or a motor problem. It's a good question. I don't think we have any here. Is it possible you could have popped that brake or somehow when you were messing with the motor back there and not known it? Circuit breaker, if we can get to it. Oh. An intermittent problem is kind of, it, it's not good. It would be nice to find either a problem that doesn't work or it does work, then it's easy to fix from there. What the hell's it doing? It locked up. Boy, we want to stick the nuts off of this. Open here to get breakers. <laughs> is it good? Bad? Well, they were looking for a green one. Ah, there we go. There she is. Man. Who's your daddy, Rick? Oh, you got it? It's only you 47 years old. It's to work great. <laughs> These problems, now overcome, are the last of several the team faces in preparation for their first X-Prize flight. You know, it's wobbling. It's just... I don't know what that thing Well, that's not going to be good. They're in there. The plan for Pete Siebold to fly the first of the two X-Prize flights hits a snag just days before the flight. We had a shock in the program. That is the illness of, of Pete Sabol. He was the selected pilot to fly the first X-Prize flight. He had a, uh, a health problem. He was actually in the hospital at the same time his wife was giving birth to their second child. He came to Doug and I, and he asked us to take him off of the flight. It was an extremely difficult decision for me. It's something that uh, you know I've been working for for three years, and and uh, you know really the opportunity of a lifetime. With very little time to prepare, Mike um, accepted the challenge and, and moved out. I mean, you know, on the one hand, it's not as much of a stretch for Mike as it would be for, uh, let's say, for Brian in this case, because Mike had simply flown the airplane more times and much more recently. But it still means you've got to, you got to go do the work. You got to get back in shape uh, for G tolerance. Mike Melville is called back to service. Uh, he was told about seven or eight days ago that he would be the pilot. Well, he was in a meeting and they requested that he do it because one of the other pilots had to step out. To be honest, I was very irritated. No, I didn't do a really good job last time. I know I didn't. Uh, everyone said I did fine, but I know looking at the data that I didn't. And I'm hoping to be able to do a, just a perfect job, fly a perfect trajectory, uh, go as high as it'll possibly go and, and then fly back safely. Well, I'd settled my mind too that he was not going to do another flight. So I had my emotions where they where I needed them to be, and then to start working and trying to get mentally prepared. And Michael had the same problem. Good morning, uh, 6.30, 4.30. <laughs> <laughs> it's... In their pre-dawn meeting, the flight team prepares for the first X-Prize attempt. The winds this morning have been 2 nine zero to 3 zero zero ten to 15. Steve, you want to let us know how your evening went? Uh, we had a pitch trim anomaly. I'm not sure if you've heard about this yet or not. It appears that we had possibly maybe an intermittent right-hand trim, pitch trim breaker. You pulled that breaker, pushed it back in, didn't try it until later, and then the first operation, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Then you reset the breaker and it worked. And it worked consistently. Um, I want you to tag that old breaker and send it back to the manufacturer for evaluation. Okay. Thanks for all your hard work. Let's have some fun. Mike Melville suits up for his second flight to space. Do you want to drop this in? I don't have any pockets. Just no pockets? Are you kidding? I have no Michael, wear the other suit. If I were you, I would just wear the other suit. You do have the truth. I'm carrying my wallet. It looks awfully tight Dumb. around you. Have you tried sitting down? It looks awfully tight around your back. I'm not sure. It's too tight around my ankles, too. I can't believe they didn't put any pockets in it. Uh, Mike, uh, I have just a little vial for you to put in your pocket. He I has no, no pockets. pockets. It's He's got a new ashes. suit. He's got a new uh, suit and no pockets. The stupid suit doesn't have any pockets. Oh, what, what's, what's this? Well, oh, that's right where my knee is. I can't put anything in there. What I'm talking about, just a tiny little vial. Okay. Oh, yeah, I can do that here. 
Mike Melville, who flew the first private flight to space, must now do it once more with 400 extra pounds of cargo. I feel fine. I feel great. Like this, long ways to build it. Stop away a little bit. Are you taking your bag with you? I'm going to have to. There's no pockets in the suit. So we're pound too heavy. We're going to weigh those. What are those? Pine trees. Yeah. <laughs> Take care, Mike. Is that engine going to run? It's going to run Give great. Give me a hug. Give me a hug. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> you look very handsome when you see it. Because you have a small butt and huge shoulders. <laughs> that I wear is something that I gave to Sally when she was 16 years old. And on every major flight that I've ever done, Sally will pin that on me and take it off when I get back and put a horseshoe on and hold, it holds some luck for me. And it's worked for me. Michael's realistic. He, um, he said to me today, you know, I wondered if I was pushing, pushing my luck doing a second flight. You know, have I, have I, am I asking too much? You know, Lady Luck or whoever it is. Uh, this will get kind of burned. Let's go up here. Yeah, we'd love to We're just asking you to look at the uh, engineering page and give us the uh, eye out. Okay. I had 13.53. I think that was a little late. Hey, White Knight, uh, Scott 1, 2, ready to go. White Knight, uh, flight 16P. It's 29 September. Time is 14.10, 59, 14.11. Ship one goes into a dangerous roll. Or left the outram. Left the outram down. Yeah. Hey. Motor's normal. Yeah. Shut off as soon as possible. Yeah. Shut down. 328. Yeah. As he approaches the edge of space, Mike Melville fights for control. Yeah. 77 seconds to shut down clean and the feather is green. We're going to have to use a lot of the RCS to help us out. Copy that. Being a pilot and understanding what he's doing, I know what goes on out there. And sometimes it's it's not such a good thing. Okay, start the feather up so you can work on the RCS. Feather's coming. Okay, feather's so coming and it's green. At 160 degrees per second, roll right? Copy that. Good RCS, eh, Mike? It's the right to slow down, so it's good. Heading up to a blue 328. What's radar? It matches. And the radar cross check's good. Mike, the trajectory looks great. You're going to go just right down the red line to the uh, entry point. He's currently 5.4 east, uh, coming through 3.4, just about an apogee. Call 
at the eight mark. Dad said he was going to try and call it out, but last time he missed it. You know, he did wasn't he blinked at the, the aperture. A friend had given me a camera. I saw that I had the rights under control, and I actually still had a little bit of roll going on at that time, which was good for pictures. So I picked up the camera, I turned it on, and made sure the flash wasn't going to work. I only ended up with four good shots, but I took uh, probably took eight shots. Everything's great in the back end. My proportion is cool. Start reverse uh, the roll. Good. Spaceship and space. Okay, start pick up Q. Spaceship and base. Um, here you land clear, honey. Land clear, thanks. And everything's cool in the back end. Yeah, cool. Okay, we're gonna see probably some oscillations on entry. Yeah, I'm gonna get a bit carried away with the camera. Then. Hang on. Okay. He's taking pictures. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Here I am bowling and he's taking pictures. 150,000, 4.4 east, northeast of the bullseye. Doing okay? Doing fine. Okay, peak G is past, peak Mach was free. You'll do both. RCS off the feather screen, you're passing 71,000 and you want to start it down pretty soon for glide range. Fine and glide range. Oh, it's just slow up. Yeah, why don't you make the speed about 135 to 140? We'd be happy with that. So the spaceship is in the middle. Yeah. No, the spaceship is in the middle. No, not heading, not concurrent. Still have a hiking, uh, glide, sorry, glide, come on. Yeah, I see that. We're, we're, basically, we're basically, can't do any we're basically jump starting an industry. You cannot do any better. And I can't believe it's happened so soon. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. trajectory looked great. Mike was doing a way better job than we'd seen in the past. There wasn't a lot of roll-offs early on that we'd had. and uh, Everything just looked great. He captured the trajectory and had it nailed, and we're thinking, man, this is going great. And all of a sudden, the roll rate took off. At the point where it happened, we were rolling very fast. We were faster than the speeding bullet. Mach two and a half. We saw this thing rolling and rolling and rolling as if it was undamped, uncontrollable. It started rolling at very high rates. The initial, the first turn, was 283 degrees per second. If you had that much rate going into space, you would really have a problem. It was disorienting, and I had to really keep my head still and just watch the instruments. You couldn't bear to look out the windows because it was, it was really spinning fast. I put my hand on the switches to shut them off. And uh, then it started coming down because I had all the controls in opposite that. And so that's, we were still in the atmosphere. We still had a little bit of control authority. Looked at the display and I said, Yeah, I think I can live with this. And so during the flight, I was watching those rates and I knew that uh, we could stop the rates of that magnitude. We didn't want this roll, it's certainly not desirable. We didn't think it was dangerous because we knew the loads were real low on the ship. And, and we both on the ground and Mike in the air together made about the same reaction and conclusion. Mike, everything's green here. We're just looking. he was waiting to see the predictor show at least 328,000 feet. And they saw 328, Doug immediately said shut it down. I waited just long enough to see 334 on there, on my indicator. And I shut it down, and it turned out to be almost 338. Okay, start the up so you can work on the RCS. Mike was able to stop the rolling by using uh, our reaction control system, which is, uh, we have it's basically two scuba bottles which have very high pressure air in it, 6,000 psi, and through a series of valves they go to little nozzles that are in various places in the airplane, and, and those shoot out air, and it's, they're basically little compressed air rocket motors which we can use to stop the rates, and that's how I was able to do it. So what we're doing is we're staying out of that area by not going to the, to the zero angle of attack. Instead of getting early in the trajectory straight up, we'll leave it off a few degrees. So the last part of the trajectory, we'll still have a little bit of lift, still making a little bit of turn. You guys are nuts. Space like, I think we're essentially there. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, you don't need to take any out because I got it close enough on a wing. Uh, okay, now what we got to do is package this better and get the sculptures wrapped up and get them in. Just two days after the first qualifying flight, the Scaled Composites team makes final preparations for the second and potentially winning X-Prize attempt. I'll, I'll just this stuff later. Bert Rattan sorts out the souvenirs that will travel to space. And what else? Uh, most of this on the top, unfortunately, is the... Uh, is the... Uh, oh, no bear. Got another bear? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Let, let's just... Uh, Let's leave this guy out. Last time we went around and got heavy tools from people all yeah. over the shop, and we were putting in wrenches. And, no, and, uh, I've got a lightweight flag, but we'll go though. Monday, October 4th, 2004. The team is ready to capture the Ansari X Prize. You know, this is going to be the most fun one. I know. This is a money flight, baby. I gave him my ring, and I said, just think of this ring as me being with you up there.
I'm doing great, Doug. All systems are green here, Brian. No worry about temps in the back end. Uh, we're looking good here. Okay, here comes the G's. Copy that. Five G's. A sonic boom punctuates Brian's perfect flight as Spaceship One returns to Earth. I know, I, I know, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Congratulations. <laughs> After capturing the X-Prize, Brian Benny makes his final approach in Spaceship One. Brian, you're the man. <laughs> no, it's just a couple more points on the card. That's right. Just the one that repeats face right. I'm trying to look at people, see where they're looking so we can see it. <laughs> you got the upper inside. Deep breath. Okay, deep breath. No kidding. Can I get a shot of the three of you guys right here? Oh, you bet, you bet, you bet, absolutely. <laughs> Gotta love it. Pretty nice kickoff for space tourism, huh? You're home, baby! Good. Okay, now pick up the speed, right? He's 134. Excellent. 100. Got the runway made for good. Looking good, right down the middle. Okay, there's 20. That's the flare. Good. Five, start, level off. Four. Way to go, buddy! Congratulations! It seemed like the next call, he said 328. And we're still burning, and I look back up at the video. How about them apples? <laughs> Hey, you got the X-15 by more than 13,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> and I just had a feeling, hey, we're going to the stars, you know. It is, this is so cool. You gotta love it. Oh, I so, oh, you got, is that Mike's? It's Mike. It is Mike's. It's, we're gonna have to uh, share it. <laughs> Mike, it's so happy, dude! <laughs> nice job, nice job, great job. Beautiful. Thanks, Dad. Yeah, buddy. Right there. Here, let me get that door from you. After three and a half years, Bert Rattan and his team at Scaled Composites celebrate their victory. I absolutely have to develop a manned space tourism system that's at least a hundred times safer than anything that's ever flown man to space, and probably a lot more. I have to do that. I'm also very proud, I'm also very proud to say that we did indeed uh, go after uh, uh, beating the X-15's record, which is set in 1963, and we beat it by uh, about 13,000 feet. I thank God that I live in a country where this is possible. And, and I really mean that. But, um, there's no place on earth where you can take this flag, bring it to space, and have, you can start a week out on a Monday like this with this, these kinds of events. It's just a fantastic start. The fact that uh, a small little company like ours that's a private company using private funding is able to achieve something like this. Uh, this is a very difficult thing to achieve. I mean, no one has ever done it before other than a, an entire country's government. You know, I was thinking today that I, I might as well retire and find a new career because it's not going to get better than this. It's not, the next prize is great, but the better part is knowing that I did it with my friends and I did it with people I have such tremendous respect for. Yeah, really <laughs> Whoa. Holy moly. If you're going to take the record, you might as well do it instead. You can't ask for a better experience. It's wonderful. Wimp, on the three <laughs> You guys put your hearts in it, not just your sweat in it, and you put your talents in it. The important thing about today's accomplishment is this is not an end, it's just a very good beginning.
Okay, stand by for the president, please. We'd like to meet you too, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, it'd be an honor. Thank you. Congratulations to you all. Thank you very much for, uh, for dreaming the big dream. Yes, sir. We're looking forward to uh, being with uh, Laura on the Tonight Show here in the next day or two, also. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. You're, you're, meeting, you're meeting the better half. Yeah. Uh, West Texas is like Mojave. The sky is very big, and therefore you have big dreams. Anyway, congratulations to you all. Thanks for taking my phone call. Thank you. Thank you.